A Generous Life and this worship series, it's really meant to build week after week. And so if you missed last week's series, I uh, encourage you to grab a sermon when you leave or go to our YouTube channel and, and watch last week's service. But there's a couple concepts that we have to remember that we started with last week that really does carry over to this week and next week as well. And the first concept, to remember, is what our definition of a generous life is, right? We're using this as, as a way of living marked by regular giving. And one of the ways we talked about this is we said that a generous life and generosity is never about amount. It's always about the heart. Generosity is always about the motivation behind it. And so you have to begin this. If we don't understand this motivation, then we might as well not even talk about being generous. And this is our motivation, right? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So if you would tell someone or if you think that I should be giving more, or I have to give more, that's not generosity. At least that's not gospel generosity. Um, Generosity looks like this. It says, and it's the mindset that says, I am a generous person. That's how God views me. Because he views me through the lens of Jesus. He sees sometimes my imperfect gifts, that he sees them always as perfect gifts, he, he sees my lack of generosity as time is always generosity because he's looking at me through Christ. And so when you talk about generosity, begin with motive, then everything follows in a proper way. And so this morning what we want to focus on is a story that Jesus tells to talk about relationships with our resources. I think we all can agree that, that the two greatest things we have been given is our time, and everything else, right? The resources that we have at our disposal. And especially, right, the question we're going to look at today is, what is the purpose for all of that? And the story that Jesus is going to tell us is a story about money. And as we look at this story, we're going to ask ourselves the question, what is the purpose for what I have been given Am I just looking at the now? Am I just reacting to to what happens on a daily thing? Or do I have a bigger picture in mind? And when Jesus tells this story, remember, this is a parable, right? A parable is a story with a spiritual truth. And one of the things when you read the parables of Jesus, there really is just one truth that he is trying to convey. There's a lot of different ancillary things about parables, especially in this one. But we're focusing on, okay, what's the point? What's Jesus trying to help us as we look at our relationship that we have with money? So we're going to look at each verse and talk about it this morning. Here we go, beginning of Jesus' parable. He said, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give me an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. So in those days, right, someone who was very wealthy had a manager over his estate. Maybe today you might even think of that person. You might have a financial advisor, somewhat similar in that. And this manager was bad at his job. He was going to be fired. Uh, And so the owner says, bring in the books. I want to see what you're doing. You're going to be losing your job soon. Next couple verses. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master has taken away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So this manager, right, another way you might call him a steward. That's that name, stewardship, comes from this. This manager, has a, he's very self-aware. Doesn't want to work too hard. He right, doesn't want to dig, so soft hands, they want to get calluses on him. Realize that he's a manager who's being fired, so no one's going to hire him again. So now he's thinking. I have this very short amount of time. I have the owner's resources. What can I do? How can I use them in this short amount of time 
in a way that really, right, benefits him. We go on. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 800. So this manager is uh, very wise. He realizes, okay, I want to make the people in my life, my my friends, very thankful for me. So I'm going to cut their bill. First person, he cuts their bill in half. Second person, right, he takes 20% off of their bill. And, And you understand his thinking. He knows that these people will be very thankful. And I'm guessing in his mind, like, I'm so glad you're thankful because very soon, I want you to remember what I've done. Because very soon, I am going to need your help. So I guess the question we start to ask ourselves, what do we think about the manager and, and what he's doing? Right, you might think, that's why he's getting fired. He is stealing from the owner. If this person was working for you, you would not appreciate this, this last minute, right, tactics in his life. So what Jesus says. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. He commended the dishonest manager. Now, understand something. He didn't say that he commended the dishonesty of the manager. Right? This is not a story that says the end justifies the means. But what Jesus is commending is the fact that this manager had these resources. He had a certain amount of time. And he was going to do the best he can with what he has been given. So the master commends the wisdom, the shrewdness of the manager, not the dishonesty of the manager. Let's apply a few things this morning. Just like this manager, we have been entrusted, right? Right? Entrusted with with gifts of time and resources, gifts of time and money. And I guess the question is, how do you view them and how do you view them in your life and what's the purpose that you've been given that? Do you see a bigger purpose in your life with them other than yourself? Here's what I mean by that. Last week, uh, one of the things we looked at when we looked at giving was the idea that we are not set up, right? We are not hardwired to be generous. It's just not in our nature. Right? That, that, that's a product of the, the sinful nature that we inherit. Right? So it, it takes uh, um, thought, it takes planning, it takes teaching to go from someone who just looks at things for themselves than to be generous to others. And we said last week, it's the gospel that helps and under, makes us be generous people. So I want you to think about this for a moment. Your gift that you have of time and money, do you view them simply as for you and your own consumption? That what I've been given, I want to make sure that I have a good life or, or, or a better life, that, that I have make sure I'm taking care of my family. So everything that I have and everything that I've been given, my focus is on me and my little world. And I don't see a bigger picture with those things. Because I really do think that uh, the culture today emphasizes consumption. And there's one fact, I think, that emphasizes that too. They talk about credit card debt today. Right? The average family in America has a, about 8,600 of credit card debt. 
And granted, there might be a time when you need it, but there is an emergency and you have no other way to pay for something. But a lot of credit card debt is because people so want to consume for themselves that they can't even wait. So how do you view those gifts in your life? Is there a bigger picture? Is there a bigger purpose? Is there a bigger impact you can make from them? Now, now please, don't misunderstand this. Uh, the one thing about generosity, there is never guilt that's a part of that. A generous person, generosity in God's eyes, God doesn't want you to give out of guilt. So it is not wrong to have a, a wonderful home. It's not wrong to have a nice car. It is not wrong to take nice vacations. It's not wrong to have a second home, a vacation home. None of that is wrong. But you have to ask yourself, what is the priority of those things in my life? If those become your most priority, then I do think you are leaving the door open for greed in your heart. Remember last week we talked about greed? Greed is one of those sins that there is no external indicator of a greedy person because greed is not about the amount. Greed is only about the heart. And I think there can be a second example when the Apostle Paul in that second lesson talked about manna from heaven. Do you remember um, when the Israelites were gathering manna every day? If you said to yourself, you know, doing this every day seems strange. I don't want to work this hard, so why not just gather a whole bunch on Monday and I'll just keep it for the week? On Tuesday, if you did that, you went into your cupboard and you'd see the jars of manna filled with maggots and rotting. And I think that's also a picture of greed that you don't even know it, when those things in life, when your gifts of time and money become your first priority in terms of consuming, then, man, your heart is in danger. So I guess, what's the point of it all? What's the impact that we can make? Jesus explains last verse today. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Is Jesus saying that use all of these gifts to buy friends? No. Take a look at how he explains it. To gain friends for yourselves, to be welcomed into eternal dwellings. We're not just talking about the here and the now in this moment. Jesus is taking our eyes and our attention to eternity. And he started to think about that. How do I have eternal friends? I have eternal friends when they know what I know. When they know that Jesus Christ lived and died for them. And so the impact that we can make with our gift of time and our gift of money is an eternal impact. And you think about Jesus. When we talk about that gospel motivation verse today, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you see the impact that he made. Not only did he himself become poor, and he died and, and rose for us, but you start to look at the impact he made in his daily life. When he was healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding the hungry, right? two things were happening there. He was taking care of a person's immediate needs. But he also put their eyes on eternity. He wanted to take care of the need they had right then, but he also wanted them to see him as the Son of God and see that what really mattered was their relationship with their God. And that's what Jesus wants us to think too. When you look at your gifts that you have been given by God, and, and how great how Martin Luther explained all that, Right? And it starts to be so detailed, right? Land and cattle, right? You kind of see the, the historical nature of this from the, the middle to late 1500s. But it does underscore the point that everything that we have is God's. 
And God doesn't need us to give those things back to him. But others need those things. You don't have to go too far. Um, not just around the world, not in the United States, but even in the valley where you see right, poverty and homelessness, uh, people going hungry. And you ask yourself the question, why are all those things in this world? Right? The Christian worldview says all of that is a product of the fall into sin. And that is the reality that that is what it means to live in a broken world. And we talk about eternity, when we talk about heaven, one of the descriptions of heaven in the book of Revelation is the absence of all of those earthly problems. But here's another truth, I think. That God uses people, he uses the gifts he gives you and me to partially restore the brokenness of this world. That's one of the connections that Jesus makes right, in the Gospels. Is he talking about the end of the world? He says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. Right? Jesus is making a connection to our faith and our actions and especially our faith and our impact we're making for people in the now. And that impact isn't just for here, but that impact is for eternity. So a generous life and a generous person ask themselves, how can I make an impact, an eternal impact with the gifts that God has given me? And we're not just talking about offerings here. We're talking about everything we have been given in this life. And that's going to look different for everybody. It's going to look different, right? Because even the Apostle Paul, as he was speaking about giving and he's taking this collection, he says, our goal is not that you have very little and you need so others have more, right? He said, our goal is equality. Our goal says that when you have been blessed, you can then help others. And if you're in need, they can help you too. And so how are you going to make an impact? For some people... That means they are uh, very good at fixing small engines, right? There are members who help me when I have my lawnmower an issue because I, I know very little, so much so that when I thought my blade was dull, Larry said, Pastor, I, I fixed it, but here's a little hint. It was upside down. It wasn't actually dull. I'm like, oh, my bad. Right? You have a snowblower. You, you help your neighbors out. You have a, a living room and you host a growth group. You have a Christian home and, and you make sure that that's a great safe place for your kids' friends. There's nothing better than on a Sunday morning to see a row of kids here who are barely awake because they were dragged to church w with the Christian family. For others, that's taking in someone who, for a short period of time who, who just needs a little bit. Right? What you have to think about is take a look at how you've been blessed. Take a look at your resources. And, and as God has given you all of these different areas of life that you are responsible for, that you are a manager for, your own family, right? There, and then you start, okay, how then can I make a bigger impact? Because you know, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you know that, it changes your view of everything that you have. And when it changes that view of everything that you have, then your eyes don't just look here, your eyes look there, your hands open up. And we, as a group of Christians and as a community of believers, make an impact not just for today, but for eternity. Amen.